North Street Neighborhood Association. Thank you. And as I understand that Rick and Patrick are here for the item number one? Yes. No. No? <laughs> yes, are you no. just here for the fun of it? I am. I'm, I'm oh. here just to uh, observe the... Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and I'm here too. And, okay, I'm here. And what are you here for? Uh, update on um, permits and bags and... Solid waste update. Solid waste update, okay. Um, well, the order that we have it here is the contract to tie and bond and then solid waste. Is that agreeable to everyone? Oh, oh they, they're, they're, changing, they're, they're changing things on you. Do you have a new? I, I gave you a new one. You so, had one right at your oh, okay. station. Oh, okay. I'm on the wrong one. We need to Sorry. vote on the minutes. Oh, we didn't vote on the minutes. Oh, well. Thank you so much. Gotcha. <laughs> Anything to stretch this out? Did everybody, <laughs> did everybody approve of the um, five? Aye. 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 Yeah. Yes. Chairperson, yes. I need to recuse myself from item one under new business. Oh, that'll save us some time. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to leave the room, but I hope that you come find me before we do item two. Uh, all right. Well, we'll probably, <laughs> that could take some time. We'll probably move to solid waste update after that. Tiger Bond for structural and environment evaluation of the barn in the amount of $17,200. Move approval. Uh, second. Okay. Um, okay, you were all aware of what happened at the barn um, yes. about two weeks ago. Um, I had to leave the meeting early that night, so I know Jim covered the rest of that. Uh, basically, we solicited a proposal from Tiger Bond to do a structural evaluation of the floor and to also look at environmental work that may need to be done with standing water and mold beneath the floor. So that proposal uh, does that. It's somewhat detailed in nature. Um, I'll throw it here real quick. Uh, basically, they're going to do a site visit to review the existing conditions and meet with the highway superintendent and uh, so they can discuss the concerns and what the uses of the building are so, so they can do a better structural evaluation of do we do point loading in certain areas and jacks and lifts and so on also. Uh, they're going to be doing trench sampling of the water down below the crawl space there where the hole opened up and also below the uh, equipment bay itself where there's standing water. Mm -hmm. They're also going to take uh, six air samples and a, a four tape lift samples for the mold that they found underneath there and have that analyzed. They're going to do a structural evaluation of, of the existing slab capacity so they can get an idea of what kind of work can be done on it and what kind of remediation work we need to do to support the hollow ground underneath the existing floor. And then they're going to lay out a number of potential repair options to, uh, that we could use, uh, finish up with an existing conditions report and opinion of profitable construction costs. Are there any questions? Just where's this money coming from? Uh, since the enterprise funds also use the building also because it is mechanics work, it will probably be a four-way split between the three enterprise funds and one side on the general fund. Oh. And Thank is you. DMP, uh, any more questions? Is DMP, DEP also involved because of all the sampling that you're doing or you're going to... Not at this point. Re there's no reason to notify them until we know we have an issue. Okay. So first we do the research and then we right. see what we have to do. We have nothing's been flagged to us that there is a, a real concern at this point. But once we get the uh, the analysis done, we'll know better. Did you want to make a comment? I, I just wanted to thank the board for um, uh, having approved the contract, but for at least uh, hearing it out because I think the issues that um, are in that facility over there need to be addressed. Um, I think they've been a long time coming, and unfortunately because of the state of the nature of the city budget, it's been very difficult to get things done. However said, um, the, the fact that all of our equipment is outside right now and the fact that uh, you know each vehicle that's out there is worth about $130,000. So if you do the mathematics, we've got $7 million worth of equipment that's sitting outside that we can't put away. Uh, and we're fortunate we're having an easy winter because all the sanders are uh, 
have to be inside and stay warm. Um, and we're lucky that actually the, the hole in the floor didn't, you know, wasn't larger. It just happened to be an empty truck drove over it. But I think uh, it's also the employees that work in that facility are also uh, concerned about their uh, health and welfare, but they are also appreciative of the, the, the work that's going to be done uh, in, in the facility. And hopefully, um, you know, we can try to figure out what to do after we have the, all the findings and where we can go from there. Thank you. Any other comments? Is, I was thinking about you know, driving by the, the, old, the former Ford dealer Blida on King Street. They've got a big empty building there. High doors. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility we would, we could have a temporary rental? They've had a number of problems down at the old Blight of Ford site or the Leah Honda site, if that's what you want to call it, with vandalism, uh, homeless people living in it, breaking and entering on a consistent basis down there. We met with uh, one of the representatives from Leah Group down there, and they've been having difficulty keeping people out of that building. One of the other thoughts that Louis Hasbrook mentioned, the building inspector mentioned to us, that if we, uh, presently he doesn't he doesn't want the department utilizing that side of the building for any storage or anything. He did say, however, if we were to purchase uh, one-inch road plates, um, that we could actually put the road plates over the areas uh, that look like they are potentially a concern. However, um, and I don't know if you can mention it or not, but we've had one early estimate to get road plates to purchase road plates is about $34,000. For 15 one-inch road plates, which would cover the span of the um, main uh, alleyway where all the, the heavier vehicles park, primarily the Sanders. You know, that, that cost would probably work out better than a rental building. Yeah, at the last board meeting, we thought it was going to be 10 to 12,000. That's mm -hmm. reflected in the board meeting minutes. Mm -hmm. When Rich was starting to solicit new pricing, steel is up. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's that's based on one quote. I'm still waiting for. Two other quotes to come through, like they're kind of slow, but um, that's that's also another option. But I think there's a greater, and that's entirely up to how. It, yeah, I think that it would be probably a good idea to go ahead and see exactly what is in the floor mm -hmm. and exists there before, um, because it would be kind of unfortunate if we went and bought all the road plates, mm -hmm. and then in reality we had to actually do something drastic to the floor, and maybe we'd have all these road plates that we primarily would really spend $34,000 on instead of taking the $34,000 and put it in the building. So <clears throat> It is an emergency fix to get the vehicles back inside, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we know the time frame for this contract? Um, I assume that they did not give any time frame, but I assume it will be done ASAP. I would yeah, imagine 30 days. Yeah. We, st we stressed the importance of the project to them when they came out. Rich and I met with them on the site. Actually, the day we called them, they were, they were going to send somebody out that day. They came out the following morning. But the time bonds were really responsive on it. So I would say we want 30 days to work with you. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go get it. Are you going to go get it? Yep. Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion? Yeah. Uh, you get all that. Oh, you mean I vote? I, I agree. I'll make a motion that we take the solid waste update out of order. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hey, here's Mike. Oh, we need a second on that. Who's that? Oh, <laughs> stranger. Almost forgot you were here. Almost. Would anybody like to second taking the um, solid waste update out of order? Okay. Um, I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. So this is similar to the format that I used in October when we didn't really have very much history yet because we start we stopped selling stickers September 1. So now we have basically seven months, but you know, keep in mind that, that really the system didn't start until September. So this report goes from July 1, 2011 until the end of um, the calendar year. And um, so you can see the first item is that the residential permits, we lost some residential permits, but we're up on the senior permits. So overall, 
down 9% on the, on the permits. We are still selling permits, so this is, you know, kind of an ongoing thing. We may gain by the next time that I sold. I sold four of them today. What is it in? The, well, the permits are sold on a fiscal year basis. So it is in July? Yes. Okay. So we're, so it, we're still selling them, but... You're, you're yeah. 90 percent? Yep. And then um, the next box is about the day passes, which is basically, you know, people without vehicle permits who want to have access to the landfill. So what we're seeing with the 70 percent um, business and non-resident is partly economy and partly valley recycling. Um, when you go down to bulky waste cards, that's, that's disposal of bulky waste at the landfill. That, that definitely is showing some impacts of economy and other competition. Um, of course, the bag stickers are going to go down because we've gone to the bag program. Um, so the, this um, residential disposal revenue, this is basically a combination of the bag stickers and the bags and, well, it's a, an addition of everything above that. Um, so, you know, apparently we're, we're getting a lot more revenue, but we have to su subtract cost of the, bags. The, the cost of the bags, which is significant, and also at the beginning of the program, you know, all these bags were shipped out to retailers and then recalled, and so even though they were replaced at no cost to the city, that the actual value was subtracted from, you know, it, that, that's a little complicated. But that's, that's kind of a glitch that I hope won't happen again. So overall, even though we've, we've um, the number of customers has gone down, you know, the, the revenue has held steady. Then, then going down the next three boxes are basically showing the proportion of bags that were sold. And most communities, according to Waste Zero, purchase 70% large and 30% medium, and they don't have any small bags at all. So, you know, you can see that Northampton has kind of turned this upside down, mm -hmm. that most people are using, well, a majority of people are using the medium bags. Which is, which is good from a waste reduction point of view. You can see that people are probably downsizing in their bags, but <coughs> the impact on the city is that it costs us more because two medium bags cost the city more than one large bag. So we've had to actually, you get that? That, you know, per unit gallon of disposal, two medium bags cost more than to the city than a large bag. For the bag itself, not for the trash disposal. Right. So that's had an impact on, um, you know, we've originally budgeted $50,000 for the year supply of bags. We've just recently had to uh, make an amendment to that contract. And it, it you know, it, it may go up another, you know, $20,000. The other thing that, that affected this budget was that the, originally we were using a, a, a 1.7 mil large bag and because we found that that wasn't adequate we went to 1.9 mil which added to the, the cost of the large bags too. What's the capacity for large ones? Um, 37, 37.6 gallons. gallons. Um, and the medium? Those are 14.8. 14 gallons? 14.8, so almost 15. Um, then you can see that we've continued to do a lot of exchanging, and you know, this is, at this time, it's, we're still exchanging for defective bags. And when we get, I have a collection of defective bags, and when I, we're always asking where they bought them from so that we can you know, if they're coming from Cumberland Farms, then, you know, we get that lot out of there. And But to tell you the truth, that's not a very good way to be addressing it. I think 
I'm disappointed with the bag quality, especially the uh, the medium bags. And what what is that? Is that a state low bid uh, bag the, or? It's actually the only um, vendor on the state contract that offers, um, you know, holding the inventory, shipping to retailers, billing the retailers, and reporting. What do other vendors offer? You know, do we have anybody that's near what what we want? Well, the the other thing is that the um, there's a vendor that doesn't carry a drawstring bag. They have, you know, the kind that you, you know, oh yeah, tie tip, tie up. Um, and I think that might be a difficult transition to go to a different style bag. Um, there is one vendor who will hold the inventory and ship directly to vendors or retailers, um, but they won't do the billing. But I think certainly the, uh, the number of complaints about the bags has dropped off significantly since we first rolled out the program. Yes. Um, I think Way Zero has tried to do a pretty reasonable job at addressing our concerns about quality, although not perfect. Mm -hmm. But did I understand you correctly to say that there's only one vendor for the medium bag? What there's only one vendor that offers what they call a this turnkey. I understand, system. yeah, but just one. But there's more than that for the large ones because there's um, more demand in other. Well, vendors. any any um, trash bag manufacturer can custom make any size bag, so it's not the size; it's more um, the services that they will provide and. You know, to some extent, the style of, of bag that they offer. Mm -hmm. So this is so the only vendor that's available under the state contract. That's true. That's true. But there probably are other companies that would be able to mm -hmm. offer the service. Mm -hmm. But all the accounting, sort of the soup to nuts program implementation, is what we zero is yes. able to do under the state. Yep. So the the um, the last box here. You know, apparently we've lost 9% of our customers, but we've lost more than 20% of our trash. So that shows that the unit-based pricing system has had the desired effect, that it's reducing, it's reducing waste. And, you know, when we've, we've lost 9% of our customers, but we've also lost 9% of our recycling, which shows that, you know, the recycling isn't being depressed um, you know, it's, it's kind of maintaining itself, which, you know, the, the Springfield MRF lost another 6% of their tonnage this year, and they're saying that's economy and that's, you know, the newspapers being thinner and the, you know, light waiting and everything else. So there's, this actually is, is a very good result on the, on the recycling side. Can you say that again? We lost 9% of our customers, but what percentage of our... Well, more than 20% of our trash, because it's down 70% between the, the two transfer stations. And just a real a simple calculation of, of um, you know, <laughs> the tonnage and, and how much revenue we've gotten, that the revenue is up. Per, per unit of trash. So, you know, that's that's also what we were looking for in terms of you know, the, so the system. Up per unit well, of trash was yeah, so, you know, if, if you just calculate how much revenue we got for the 2010 trash disposed, that was like $60.25 per ton. And when you do the same thing for 2011, it's 76.50, and it's just <coughs> you know, that's. I mean, you've got to remember that there's a lot more associated with disposal costs than just what the tipping fee is at the landfill, mm -hmm. or at a disposal facility. There's other costs associated with. It. Excuse me. Each one of these figures. You still have four months to add to these, right? Oh, yes. This is going to be an so ongoing. They're, this they're is not just, really down that one. <clears throat> this is just, you know, this is a snapshot. This is a snapshot in time. It is. It was yeah. December, so it's six months. Yeah. Yep. Six, six months, months to go. Fiscal year. Mm -hmm. 
it's yeah. six really six months of each fiscal year. In the in the top block. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why the the first two rows don't add up to the third row? Um, is there something else going well, on? That's well, well, right? it's because I base it on revenue. Um, so the senior permits only cost five dollars, and the residential permits cost twenty-five dollars. So, you know that that ninety-one percent is based on the revenue, not on the number of permits. Okay. But, but they don't add up. They. If you take the seventy thousand and the seven thousand eight hundred, mm -hmm. they don't. I'm just saying seventy-five thousand is ninety-one percent of eighty-two thousand. But these columns on the twenty ten. Oh, they don't. They do not add up. Okay. So we'll have to check the. Yeah. We'll have to check the math on that. Okay. 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 Um, I'm just curious when you see that the trash is down is there I mean do you believe that's also a correlation to the fact that we're doing the composting program because that's diverting like have you yeah. seen have those numbers gone up of people who participated in that or um, right now we have about, what 325 households participating in that program and oh, oh 325 320 households and to date since the beginning of the program, we have diverted 68 tons of food waste. During this period, it's probably more like 20 tons. Um, so I, I think it has th those kinds of things have an impact, but when you look at the overall numbers, it's still um, because we still we have a a relatively small number of um, participants who are doing a great job and diverting a lot of waste. Um, it's still not a huge impact. The 60 tons that you mentioned first was like from the beginning of the program. Yeah, that's... But um, you were saying for the last six months it was just really 20 tons. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically it's been going for a year and a half. Anybody else? Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda, if we go back to number two, is a change to the campaigning leafleting and solicitation policy. Ms. Nubial. Okay. Um, remember, we voted on this last year. We just want to change the date that we decide, um, we go through the applications. We were doing it on Wednesday, and then um, we didn't have enough time sometimes to notify people, so we want to do it on Monday instead, change the wording, so that we could actually send them a letter in the mail and they would get it in time in case you can't call them or whatever. Okay. Is there a second to? Second. To, second to the motion. Um, all those in favor of changing the date from Wednesday to Monday for campaigning weekly and solicitation policy for me. Aye. 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 question. I wasn't allowed. There was no discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also overlooked our public. And uh, you mean, would you like to? I would just like to speak on behalf of a person who worked on a campaign since you changed this policy. Uh, Oftentimes the phone calls, if they did come, were coming late. I mean, they were coming late, and I realize you're changing the date for that, but I would, I would ask the board to consider maybe looking at this policy again because when people are working on a campaign and you're trying to get volunteers to show up and do things, being told even four days ahead of time is sometimes a difficult thing to arrange to get someone there. So I, I think that um, I know previously you let, you know, the dates were differently about how you let people sign up. It's just that I just know that it was... You know, getting that call, even getting a call on Monday, you know, you, you when you're getting people to volunteer, sometimes it's difficult. You know, people have to look at their calendars. So I don't know if there's a way, I'm not asking you to do it necessarily tonight, but just I know that it was a hardship for uh, 
our campaign. I don't know if it was for the other campaign, but the, your candidate might have a place to be that morning, and then you have to send them over to that place, or it just. Thank you, Jim. Well, I think we've approved a change in it, and I think that'll let it work. Okay. And see what happens. Yeah. Just out of curiosity. Oh, didn't we agree to revisit the, the decision at a certain point, or did we not? I can't remember. Some of these we I think, I think we did. I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the minutes. Okay. All right. So Jim is saying that we should let this you know, work for a while. I think that, as I recall, we did say that we would revisit yeah. it anyway. <coughs> Thank you for your comments. Anybody else on it? Kept people from communicating with Thank you. Um, number three, under new business, contract for a water supply system asset management pro plan to Tata and Howard in the amount of $119,000. This is a contract um, uh, with Tate and Howard to do a water supply system asset management plan. Um, back in June, just as you had announced, Ro. Um, back in June last year, actually, we issued a request for proposals to interested consultants to prepare this asset management plan for us. Um, at the time um, when the proposals were received, um, we had received six proposals from a number of different um, qualified firms with the fees raising, ranging from about $80,000 to a high of about $290,000. Um, we had a selection committee that was um, that was uh, put together for the purposes of reviewing the proposals, and uh, there were two board members on it, uh, Jim Dostal and Dave, Dave Shearer, and it was uh, Ned, myself, Dave Sparks, the water superintendent, and we had asked Dave Reckow, uh, former board chair, to also be involved in the review of the proposals. Um, back at the end of the year, we had shortlisted um, to two firms, Kent Dresser McKee and Tate and Howard, and we had, uh, Selection Committee had uh, a couple of different meetings about um, which firm to work with. There was a, a price differential between those two firms, um, with CDM having a higher uh, fee than Tate and Howard. We had a meeting um, about two weeks ago of the Selection Committee, and uh, the Board Chair, Terry uh, Colleen, had sat, sat in on the meeting with the Selection Committee, and we had a, a good discussion about the scope of the project in terms of the, the scope that was in the request for proposals that we, issu we had issued. And um, basically what we had decided uh, in the selection committee meeting was that um, we would look at uh, deleting some of the tasks as not being, um, not being necessary or finding other ways to do the work in-house with, uh, with, our, our, with our own engineering staff. Um, so Ned and I went back um, to Tate and Howard and got a revised um, uh, scope of work from them and a revised fee. We negotiated um, sort of the removal of several tasks and negotiated the fee <coughs> up to the 119,600. Um, Tate and Howard's original proposal fee was 160,000. Um, so we were pleased with the with the negotiation with them in terms of both the uh, the scope of the work and also their their willingness to negotiate the fee with us down. Um, we had some discussions with them about deliverables. We've got rather than a large report, I think at the last board meeting we had a sort of a general discussion about preparation of master plans, what the report should contain, and um, trying to look at ways to save money by limiting the amount of excess paper that's prepared in reports and trying to keep things focused. So um, we worked pretty hard with Don Tata, who's the president of the company, to come up with an approach on what the report would contain and, and in which case. And, and some of the cases where we can have a tech memo for the tasks, we were going to do that. Um, they are proposing um, a, the culmination of the study to be presented um, in a brief report um, of which they had submitted um, sort of a, a sample work product to the selection committee a while ago um, that identified what this report would look like. And I thought it looked great. You know, it was, it was pretty brief to the point, um, covered and described the work that they did and documented what they documented the work that they did. And um, we feel that that report is important because it really outlines the approaches that they're going to use for the preparation of the asset management plan. So there's going to be some tools there that staff can use once the report is issued to keep the plan up to date so we won't need to keep going back um, to them to update the plan on an annual basis. So the, there's a lot of benefits to it. I think um, 
making the you know making the changes that we had discussed and coming up with a, a slightly smaller project with a at a lesser fee was a was a good way to go. Any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have not been involved in this uh, project, and uh, I would like to find out exactly what is going to be the product. What exactly are they going to do? So that's a good question. I didn't want to talk about that. Um, the, oh, you've got it. The focus of the focus of the project is preparing a new um, hydraulic model of the water system. So. Um, initially, we had talked about having them update our existing model, and then the more we looked into it, the more we realized that we would get a, a better and more accurate model if we started from our GIS system, which has been kept more up to date, more up to date than the old WaterCAD model. So they're going to prepare a model, and then they're going to use it to do certain things um, for us, including um, a review of water transmission and distribution systems to look at things like fire flow to look at things like critical users in the system, redundancy in water mains, coming up with a strategy for water main replacement, coming up with a plan um, to manage the pipe network that we have and from an asset management standpoint. Um, I think uh, several years ago it used to be just that, you know, you'd look at replacing maybe the older pipes in the system as being, it was generally thought that older pipes in the system were the worst pipes in the system. And I think what research has shown in the last few years is that some of the older pipes that you have in your system are actually stronger than some of the, the newer pipes. Mm -hmm. So it develops a plan to look at the, the age and class of the pipe, the location of it, the size, the critical customers, um, to evaluate all those factors in deciding um, which pipes to replace. Um, the, the work also includes um, an evaluation of water storage tanks and needs for the, for the city. We have a, a shortage of water storage requirements um, within the city system itself, even back in the uh, the last master plan that was done for the city back in 05 by Dewberry showed that there was a deficiency in fire flow storage within the city. Um, this is going to go back and look at water storage requirements to, to evaluate alternative sites for, for storage to meet those requirements. And um, it's going to culminate in um, what Tate and Howard calls a capital efficiency plan, which is basically a uh, capital improvements plan that identifies the critical projects that they've uh, identified through their through the analysis. Um, so the goal of the asset management plan is to come up with ranking criteria um, based on the model and other factors based based on our knowledge of rate history, um, soil type, other things that may impact with the uh, how the pipe will age over time to determine which pipes are most critical to replace. Um, and our hope is that once the plan is done, we'll have the basis of information that we'll be able to update that um, routinely using our own staff rather than having to do a master plan every few years. So that helps. Uh, thank you for the explanation. Uh, uh, as you may know, uh, Tata, Don Tata was the person who did the original water studies, Paravandis and Nichols, back in the 80s, 85, 86 which the city followed uh, quite closely, uh, the treatment plant or the transmission mains. Uh, that, that is his concept. So he's pretty well aware of the Northampton system. But I have a specific question. Is he going to explore the possibility of splitting the city into various pressure zones, which may eventually uh, put the Turkey Hill Road tank back online. We did ask for a uh, for an evaluation of that alternative to break the city into different zones. Okay, so it's part of the study. It's part of it to review. It was actually it was actually late. It was recommended by Dewberry in their report, um, and we've asked them to go back with the updated model and review the conclusions and, and see if those recommendations still hold. Okay. Any other questions? Um, MJ is going to be leaving too soon. I want to make sure that we have enough people with MJ leaving to uh, look at the other three
Change order number two to contract number 4712 from Bar Rack replacement to Delray contracting the amount of $10,350. Delray, <coughs> Delray is the contracting, uh, the contractor that we have a contract with to do the Bar Rack replacement project. The project is actually done and is done. Um, we just have a couple of punch list items, but uh, this change order work is something that we want them to do while they're while they're at the wastewater plant. We've got an issue with the uh, final effluent pumps, and uh, I'll just read this description of the the change order that we received from Kleinfeld, the SCA, the engineer on the job. They said um, the description of the change work being conducted in this change order will relocate a junction box from below the grating inside the effluent pump wet well to a location on the side of the effluent pump wet well above the grating. This involves providing new longer wiring between the junction box and the pump control panel located in the basement of the sludge building. The work also includes reconfiguration of the float switch mounting as well as replacement of the level transducer, transducer which is required due to the need for longer transducer wiring. Uh, they're stating that the work is being conducted to resolve a known plant deficiency that prohibits maintenance and adjustment of highly important control wiring when the effluent pumps are in use. This recently led to an operational issue when the pressure transducer wiring connection failed, making the effluent pump system largely inoperable. The transducer could not be repaired and the flows had dropped. It's important to conduct this, this work now before levels in the Connecticut River increase in the spring and the effluent pumps are required. So it's basically raising uh, the elevation of uh, some control pump controls and, and wiring uh, to get them up at a higher grade. No, uh, it's it, this is a critical job that needs to be done and not in a timely manner. And we felt like the best way to get it done would be to add it to the the Delray works. So Any other discussions or comments? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any more opposed? Okay. Emergency contract for an automated water valve installation for the water treatment plant to Chalmers in, in Quebec North in the amount of $6,081. Second. This is the actuator and valve control on a valve on the um, granulated activated carbon filters at the water plant. The plant is totally automated, uh, as you know, and this, this actuator is, uh, is an operator that controls when the valve is supposed to open and close, and it's, it's a, a function that, opens, op that, uh, that happens automatically, and we're having uh, a problem with this particular um, actuator, and it needs, it needs to be replaced. And, um, this contract, it's an emergency contract, um, it's greater than $5,000. Dave Sparks had a discussion with Joe Cook, uh, the procurement officer, about uh, allowing this to happen because without the automation of the valve, we're now op now we, we now have to operate this valve manually when we need to flush a filter. So it's, uh, it's causing some operational headaches. Any questions? Who's Chalmers and Kubik? They are the company that is the representative for the uh, the valve manufacturer, which is called Limitor. Yeah, they do the installation. Yeah. It's a it's a Limitor actuator. Street in the amount of $19,000. Oh, cool. We have a water pressure issue um, in the area of North King Street because of, because of an old main um, that's there. We were made aware of this uh, situation a few weeks ago when Dave Sparks was doing fire flow tests that were requested. Um, by MassDOT District 2, who's um, doing a building expansion and renovation project down there. 
um, and if we became aware of a fire flow problem out there, and um, this contract is to replace 500 linear feet of pipe, um, which will result in um, replacing an old pipe. Actually, I don't have the, the age of the pipe, which might be interesting, but it's, it's, old, it's an old main um, on North King Street. This is the type of project that we would normally do in-house. We, we designed in-house water main replacement for Old Wilson Road last year. Um, and we don't have the staff and the time to do this project, and it's something we'd like to, to bid in the spring because it's a, it poses a fire safety problem um, for a number of customers on North King Street. So this section that's being replaced is between um, Laurel Park and the Route 91 ramp near the Sunoco Station. It's about 1,500 feet of pipe. So the, the idea here is that um, we've asked Hayden and Howard to prepare construction plans. Um, staff would prepare the contract documents and the technical specifications and we would manage the construction of the project. But in order, in order to keep the project moving, we've asked them to do the, the plans for us. Any questions, concerns? Do we have a, an estimate of the construction cost for this project? We had a ballpark cost. I think that was, I guess it was about 300 grand. It was. So, somewhere in over 300,000. How much? 300,000. So, this is unexpected, is that right? It is unexpected. So, what we typically plan each year is between three and four hundred thousand dollars of water line replacement each year in our budget. Mm -hmm. So, this is something that we didn't expect. We're planning to do North Street this year. But we can still budget for it in this upcoming FY13 and have it as part of the budget process. Budget for North Street or budget for this? Budget for this. Okay. North Street's already in the system for it. Yeah. Okay. So it may have to wait until the beginning of the fiscal year to start mm -hmm. construction. But it's a priority because of the safety. Yeah. Sure, sure. Anybody else? Questions? Concerns? All approval? Okay, and uh, anyone opposed? There was some letters requesting repaving of Milton Street, or a letter, I guess. There was a letter. Milton Street has been on the capital improvements list for, I believe, at least five, if not six years at this point for reconstruction. Uh, it needs all new utilities in the street. We, understand, we know that it's in very poor condition wise on the surface, but is also in horrendous condition underneath the surface too as far as our pipelines go. So we always seem to be able to secure money for water and sewer but never secure money for drain projects. So that's why Milton Street has been designed. It's kind of on the shelf ready to go except there's not enough funding to make it happen especially on the drainage side. So keeping with the prior mayor's philosophy also of uh, trying not to pay the streets when we know we have extensive utility work to be done we should try to get the utility work done at the same time so we're not digging up a street in a five to ten year period when the funds become available. Can I also make a comment that as the mother of teenagers who drive up and down that street all the time, it serves as a very effective common measure? <laughs> <laughs> Traffic calming through lack of funding. It is no. probably, if I may, it's probably one of the worst streets in the city. I know my wife drives it every day, mm -hmm. and every time she comes home, she imagines that mm -hmm. it is in horrendous shape. But I understand why it's not being done because of the utilities underneath it. It would be throwing good money after bad, and, and you know we just don't have that kind of money to toss around. I hope you explain it that way to her. <laughs> How about the speed? Each time. I do. Each time. Is there any anticipation of when drain funding might be uh, available? Not at this point. So it could go on for another five years. It could. But drain, but there has been adequate drain funding for like North Street or some of the other streets that have North moved Street. Out the what, what we did with North Street, there was two capital improvement projects that were approved: Crescent Street and. Um, uh, Richwood Terrace, mm -hmm. and they had monies left over on the general side for drainage, so those monies were able to move into this project. I think it was about $300,000 worth of money, 
and the remainder would be made up with Chapter 90 funds, which would be a nominal amount of money. It is abysmal, and it has been abysmal for a number of years. Yeah. And, but I, I, I'm not joking when I say that it does tend to slow down the kids driving back and forth to the high school. I'm sure it does. Anything more on that? Jim, do you have anything to talk about? No. I'm going to come back to you, Mike, because I'm sure you have something. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to excuse myself. Well, before you leave, do you have anything? Everybody's still at the tactics. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> I'm all set. Thank you. Jim? Okay. DJ? Dave? Nope. You may have a floor. Can I make a motion? We haven't asked one of the Recon persons. Recognizing that the previous record is still intact, I have nothing to bring up at this time. <laughs> Yes, Jim, I would be glad to hear from you. <laughs> I make a motion we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.